Hi everybody, hope you're all doing well. Today I'll read a text by Christophe von Herrerey from a book titled Isle of Models, Architecture and Scale, edited by Nadia Maillard and Cyril Veillon and published by Tries Verlag and the PFL. Seven aims and claims of the architectural model. Number one. In his autobiography, Speak Memory, Vladimir Nabokov writes, there is, it would seem, in the dimensional scale of the world, a kind of delicate meeting place between imagination and knowledge. A point arrived at by diminishing large things and enlarging small ones that is intrinsically artistic. Nabokov remembers the first time he saw a glass slide projection and the first time he looked through a microscope at an insect's organ. In both cases, not only a reduction in scale, but also in dimension takes place. A three-dimensional reality is transformed into something flat. The architectural model has the unique advantage of diminishing the size of a building without reducing it to an image. The architectural model is what an architectural rendering on a computer screen will never be. An object and a space at the same time. Number two, in the traditional practice of architecture, focus on the realization of three-dimensional objects on the human scale for ordinary use, the model is a surrogate for the building, as an experiment, a means of communication or a souvenir. In an ideal world, an architect would erect a dozen different buildings as an intermediate phase in the design process, after which, in consultation with the client, all except the best or most suitable building will be demolished. During construction, it is impossible or very difficult to start over again, which is why there are models, to test without spending too much money, time or resources. Fewer ugly buildings would be built if more models were made. Number three. How small should a model be in order to be effective, useful and impressive at the same time? And how big? In architectural representation, drawings, photographs, sketches or models, it seems to make no sense to enlarge a building or parts of a building. Even complicated technical details are rarely, if ever, drawn or examined on a scale taller than one to one. The zoom is antithetical to architecture. The act of zooming in beyond the real scale of a building is absurd. It doesn't contribute to the projected experience of a space, nor to the calculation and the conception of its construction. What it creates is unfamiliarity, the revelation of what should never have been revealed, the confrontation with another world behind the surface of things. The result is panic. Nothing illustrates this better than the frightening opening scene of David Lynch's uh, Blue Velvet that ends with the camera gradually zooming in on a green suburban lawn until the crawling black insects behind the blades of grass and the grains of sand become chaotically visible. Architecture, in other words, is not made for insects. On the other side of the spectrum, it is important to zoom out sufficiently. In 1987, Fischel & Weiss made a one-fifth scale model of an office building, with greenish glass windows, concrete walls and metal framing. Since May 2018, this work is permanently installed in Zurich or Erlikon. It is smaller than the real thing, yes, but not sufficiently and in this case the result is comical, fruitless and almost sad. Architecture is not made for leprechauns and goblins. Number four. If architecture is, until further notice and most of the time made for the human body, then models are made for hands. They should simply be, in other words, handy. 
The best example is the model that OMA made for their project for an apartment building in Checkpoint Charlie between 1980 and 1990. The model, now in the collection of the Deutsches Architekturmuseum in Frankfurt, is conceived as a firm wooden suitcase with a steel handle that can be unfolded to reveal the building. It is at the same time a postal parcel and a briefcase for the businessman. The architect can take it with him or can uh, send it to the client without having to make a trip. The model is, uh, from a strategic point of view, a means to communicate, to persuade, to seduce and to convince, without having to use the more difficult components of the language of architecture. It is made to hand over a project to the client, and prior to that it functions as a working tool that enables the architect to manipulate an as-of-yet existing building, simply with his own hands. It is not a coincidence that André Vogensky gave the book about the architect uh, he worked for the title Le Corbusier's Hands. An architect works with his hands, but only because uh, these hands connect him in the same way a model does with a projected alteration of reality. Number five. More marginal in architectural practice, but not less important, is the mock-up. A life-size model showing a limited part of the building. A part of the facade, for example, a corner of a room, or the way a window and the ceiling meet. The mock-up is directed towards the experience of the future building by the individual, in precisely the same way as the scale model. It functions, however, at the level and the scale of the human body. The relation that the mock-up establishes is that of being one among the many, and the spectator's gaze is fragmentarily directed from the inside to the outside. The relation established by the scale model is based on the principle of being on top of it all, and it gives the spectator the feeling of mentally standing outside and above the world. In a certain way, this also shows how a model is never realistic, simply because it gives the viewer a point of view associated with power and knowledge that will never exist in reality. Number six. In his text on the Eiffel Tower, Roland Barthes suggests how every visitor to this Parisian monument makes structuralism without knowing it. Simply by looking down at the city with a bird's eye view, which is not that different from God's view, visitors see Paris as they have never seen it before. They become able to perceive relationships, borders, objects, distinctions between vacant and occupied or public and private. At least part of the world becomes a structure, a corpus of intelligent forms. Similarly, a model is an intelligent form that provides the capacity for comprehending general truths about a building in ways the building itself would never be capable of. Number seven, the relative ease with which a model is made, certainly compared to a building, might be its most important disadvantage. Isn't it too easy to make a model? And isn't it subsequently too easy to believe in a model, to take it for granted while it remains an imperfect version of reality? Within this line of thinking, it is possible to claim that the model is just another simulacrum, one of the many things we unjustifiably take uh, to be real. The model is one of the many byproducts of architecture, only referring to a building while the real thing remains farther and farther away. Since the late 1970s, architectural culture has become more and more interested in these byproducts. Exhibitions, drawings, texts, fake facades in a strada novissima, paintings, posters, movies, partially out of necessity during an economic crisis, 
partially out of the desire to escape academism and conformism. In 1976, Peter Eisenman organized the exhibition Idea as Model, Investigations about Architecture, at the Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies in New York. Eisenman wanted to show models that in no way referred to or represented buildings or architecture, a model as a non-referential idea in itself. This was a strange concept, and the exhibition was uh, rather harshly criticized. A model that does not refer to built reality is an abstract sculpture, an artistic rather than an architectural object. The fear that a model is nothing but a stand-in or a substitute for an absent building is as neurotic as it is unnecessary. A model is for architecture what language is for the world. It renders present. It makes it thinkable, negotiable, debatable, and it enables change, the possibility to do better next time around. The volume has further contributions by Nicola Braghieri, Anya and Martin Frulich, Eric Lapierre and Jo Talio. It was designed in Lausanne by Omni Group and printed in Switzerland. Ask for it at your local bookstore. I hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next one. Bye.